All right, welcome everybody. Good, well, it's afternoon where I am. I'm tuning in from Lagos. Um, it's great to be here and we're gonna be spending the next half hour or so talking about a very important topic and one that is very, very dear to my heart. Uh, my name is Molade Adini. I am the CEO of AVE West Africa Vocational Education. We focus on upskilling young people and getting them ready for work. Um, today, we're going to be speaking to intersection between education and technology, the new frontier. Sounds very Star trek -y, the new front frontier. <laughs> I've heard someone say that technology is the new gold. And... Um, Please use the chat function where we have the chat function. If you have any questions as, as our amazing speakers are, are discussing, please do feel free to just um, share, your, share your thoughts, share your comments and share your questions. I have an amazing, um, an, an amazing panel today. And as I was reading up on every single one of them, I was really getting inspired and getting super excited. Um, we have um, from Giddy Mobile, we have Adetunji Adegbesan, we have from um, Rift One, it is, isn't it? Saulo Montrode. I hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> and from Hobbiton College, <laughs> great, awesome. And from Hobbiton College, we have Julian Barbier. Um, I listened to you just a few minutes ago, Julian, just talking about the Hobbiton model. So that's pretty exciting. And I hope that we're going to just get, get right in, into it. We were supposed to have Dr. Morali. I'm not sure if she's still going to join us from Room to Read. But um, let's continue the conversation and we will we'll get on there. So education and technology. Why don't we start with just, okay, someone's saying they can't hear anything, but you guys can hear me, right? Just confirming, because technology is, is interesting, depends on where you are yeah. <laughs> and what's going on I right there. You. Great, awesome. So we're talking about education and technology um, and we're looking at, you know, specifically to, to the on, on the continent of Africa. I wanted to just go around two minutes intros. If, if, if every one of my panelists could please just introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about the work that you do, um, how it feeds into education, how it feeds into technology. I think that would be um, helpful for, um, for everybody here. So let's start with, um, I'll just go in alphabetical order. order. We'll start with Adetunji first. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Tunji Adegwesa. Um, everybody calls me TJ. I'm the CEO of Giddy Mobile. And um, we're a learning company, I like to say. Um, as we all know, the edtech space is very complicated. It's very complex because there are lots of things going on. There are people who are doing schooling. There are people who are doing teaching, education. We're focused on learning and above all, personal mastery. The problem we're trying to crack is the link between learning and opportunity. So we're trying to improve the quality of learning for people so that they can have um, learning that gives them livelihoods. And um, one major block in this space of learning digitally is engagement, right? So there are two major things. One is the, the learning efficacy. The second one is engagement. Learning efficacy applies both online and offline. But online in particular, engagement is a big issue. Most e-learning platforms have between 9 and 11% completion rates right? The very best one. So driving high engagement learning is our thing. And um, we run programs where we see um, completion rates in the 80s to 90% range. So which we think is a key thing to crack if you want to do learning programs that are long term that address learning for livelihoods. So that's us, Git Mobile. We do learning um, at scale, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people with high engagement, high uh, mastery level for opportunity. Awesome, great, thank you very much. Mm, online engagement, we're definitely gonna come back to that. Um, Julian, how about you <clears throat> tell us a little bit about Hobbiton College or Hobbiton, I don't even know if it's, if it's a college, just tell us a little bit about it. <laughs> what is that about? Yeah. It's higher ed, so uh, it's at the college level, but we kind of have uh, you know, like uh, reinvented uh, what college should be. Uh, by having a school and putting a school together. So first, this is a school that has been made in Silicon Valley focusing on tech jobs. So train, we're training people with no background to be able to uh, you know, get a job in, in technology. And this is a school with no teacher, no classroom, and no upfront tuition so that anybody can access to quality education. 
And the way this ties back to tech is that uh, the majority of our education is uh, based around the software that we have uh, developed so that anybody can run their school wherever they want at a very low cost and a very like uh, small cost of operation. Uh, so we're providing the software so that anyone can like run the school uh, the same way what we do. And now we have like partners around the world. We've running like 15 schools and more to come uh, next year, hopefully five more in Africa next year. Wow, school without borders. I think that's what you just kind of described. Um, you talked about no teachers and I wrote this down. I think, you know, no teachers, no lectures, no upfront tuition increasing access to everybody who needs it to, the, you know, to the real, as we move into the fourth industrial revolution, where, where, where we are, that seems to be where, you know, technology seems to be really important and how do we give access to many more people who otherwise would not have that access. Thank you very much, Julian. That was a good introduction. Um, Saulo, I think you, you might be slightly different. Do you actually, are you involved in any education particularly or is it more technology? Please tell us a little bit about, um, about you and your product. Okay, so I am one. So yeah, Green Studio. Uh, we are um, we are opened the company. I was eighteen. So basically, the core business of Green Studio is production, audiovisual production. We produce a lot of uh, content for TV, reality shows, video clips. We just produced after beach games that was held was held in Cape Verde last year. Uh, so. Uh, on the last five years, and right now we the one producing the teleclasses for the government, you know, because of the COVID, kids cannot go to the school. So here in Cape Verde, kids can watch uh, a class on TV, on, on national TV. So we're producing all those content. But on the last five years, what we have been doing is because we saw that there is a lack of devices in our country. And, and I'd say in Cape Verde country, we are on the West Coast of Africa. I can say the whole Africa, only 10% of households in Africa has a computer at home. So because of the price, right? For someone that lives in US or Europe to buy a two, $300 computers is, is, is nothing, right? But there is families in Africa that earns $35 a month. So we just developed a new device, a smart device uh, called the Rift one. So it costs starting $45. So you have a digital TV, you can play it on your regular monitor. You can watch digital TV. We built from the ground a new OTT platform where any content creator, you can create your channel in three minutes. Uh, also, uh, it comes with a, a, a new operative system. So a Linux operative system. So you can use it as a computer. Okay, you just need, you just need a keyboard and mouse and you can access internet, Word, Excel, and it is open source. So you can use the same board to create a drone, to create a robot. So it's open source software, open source software for learning, for kids, you know, for families and stuff. Wow, I'm sure people are gonna be asking, where can we get this? <laughs> where can we get this solution from? But we'll come to that. Um, so, so I think what we all know is that technology is the way forward. And, you know, I, I'm sure you've heard that term that goes disrupt or die, innovate or die. Um, in the continent of Africa, especially where I work, um, in, in Nigeria, COVID hit and all of a sudden it put the world in a little bit of a panic. In some other parts of the world, it was easy for education to continue. People were able to go online um, and continue learning. But for the continent of Africa, it was a little bit challenging because we then realized that, hang on a minute, uh, we don't actually have the infrastructure and and the access. When we talk about access to education, we talk about access to everybody. It's not just about a select few. So I want to spend the next couple of minutes, maybe just, um, maybe Tunji, you can help us. TJ, you can start off by talking to us. What are the challenges that you see when it comes to education and technology um, on, on the continent? What are the challenges that are pervasive out there? And then maybe we can speak more about how as an innovator, as an entrepreneur, how do I then begin to overcome these challenges? Okay, cool, thanks, thanks a lot. So I think the key, and in my opinion, the most important thing to do is to understand the problem one is trying to solve, right? So like I said, education spans a lot of activities, a lot of stakeholders, a lot of players. And, you know, unfortunately Africa has lots of problems. 
So there is this schooling problem, there's institutions, right? So institutions, whether they run properly, whether the teachers are in school, whether the, you know, they're run, and then you have solutions that could be working on that. You have school management solutions, for example, that are targeting the problem of the institutions. Then you have the teachers, right? And teachers problems vary very widely from remuneration to training, to selection, to motivation. You could have different types of technology solutions, you know, try to help in that regard. Then you also have the learners, right? Who have the schooling, the exposition, the, the personal mastery. So I think actually that a number of solutions attempt to do too much um, and so get lost within the cracks. Because one other characteristic of EdTech, as you may know, is that um, there is a beneficiary, there is a person who is going to pay, and there is a person who, is, who values the outcome. So then the second issue is a business model to make this work. So I, I tend to say that um, the major issue is the education. The tech, I don't think there is a huge amount of innovation in the very technology. The innovation is in how to use the technology. The technologies that can move the needle for Africa's um, education already exist. But the problem is understanding which specific problems one is trying to solve. I'll give you the example, for example, of um, we, we work on personal mastery. And personal mastery is complementary to schooling. So you've been to class. You may have had a good teacher or a bad teacher or a, an OK teacher. But then that is not the end of learning. So you've just been, this topic has been exposed to you. You may have homework to deepen, but then when do you actually think and study and go deep and internalize this learning? From the cognition point of view, there is a codification, a storage, a recall. This process that makes that learning your own, which is the core type of learning you require for work and for livelihoods, not just being able to recite things. That will help you earn a living. So what we found is that the vast majority of the learners in a set like Lagos had no schooling whatsoever during the period of COVID, right? Because only the minority of those who are in well-to-do schools could continue digital. But we found that even though our solution was planned as a personal mastery to follow up on what you did in school, a lot of the learners just sort of like started using that tool on its own to sort of um, supplement and do substitute for what they were missing from the schooling point of view. And then you're like, hmm, can this solution sort of like stretch to that degree or do you have to wait back, wait for school to come back? And then you have to, you play around with business model, with structure, with, because the problem is a little bit complicated. I don't want to say too many things or sort of like hog the time, but let me stay with the, the problem that, I think the key thing is there are lots of different types of problems, right? So. There's problem for the learner, problem for the teacher, problem for the institution, problem in the class, problem outside the class, problem at home, social cultural context. And a lot of solutions would do much better if they were a little bit more laser focused on which of the problems that they're trying to do. A lot of solutions that are just content, um, content exposition may not be addressing personal mastery problems, for instance, because mass, um, learning effectiveness is one of the biggest problems we have and so on and so forth. So I, I, my own um, perspective yeah. is a lot more nuance in understanding what problem you're trying to solve because there's a lot of tech out there already. Okay, thank you very much. So the problem is multifaceted and you need to kind of break it down and figure out which one am I trying to solve and how. Uh, Julian, um, I, you know, the idea of training software engineers who don't necessarily have any background, who come in, no tuition, opening up the access is an exciting one. Um, you talk about Africa and coming in, opening in five African countries in the next year. Um, but we also know that a lot of, there are lots of young, hardworking, willing to learn um, people on the continent. But the one thing they don't have is the tools, um, both the software and the hardware. How are you looking at, uh, at that challenge um, and how are you thinking of actually supporting this access? It's one thing to want to give them the access, but if they don't actually have the tools, is there anything that Hoberton does to sort of help improve the access um, to both the hardware and the software? Yeah, there's like, there's different types of, uh, of access and like, you know, going back to what TJ was saying, like, I completely agree. Like you have to think about what is the problem and the tech needs to be helping uh, a solution that has been like thought of as a solution for education. 
So like there's too many, uh, you know, ed tech companies who are focusing on tech instead of focusing on edu. Education. Like you need to yes. focusing on ed. And then once you have like the right, you know, like education, then you want to supplement that with the tech to solve all kinds of problems. And I agree with TJ, there's like many different things and you need to think about each one of them. So one of them is accessibility, right? So one of the things we're doing, and you know, like on top of, um, you know, like removing the, the, the financial barrier is to also work on an admission process that is completely blind, completely automated, remove, removing the human bias so that anybody can have access to that. And then once you get in, we do like, you know, many different things and COVID has accelerated our efforts there because like, we had like physical schools in Africa and we had to, uh, you know, like move everybody it's online right. because we were closing. Mm -hmm. And so we worked with our partners and like, this is really like why we have local partners because they really understand the local uh, complications and challenges on bringing not only the education at home, but also like giving the computers to those who needed the computer. And sometimes, you know, like um, depending on, on the continent and the country, you know, 5G uh, or like 3G, like to be able for them to access internet. You know, one of the big, uh, if you want to solve accessibility and if you want to solve education at scale, through online or, or tech, you also have to provide infrastructure. This is not my job, I yeah. think. But you're gonna have to rely on the efforts of you know, governments to provide with infrastructure. So with level zero is really making sure that everybody has access to the internet. Level two is that everybody has access to online education, no matter what the level is, so that anybody can have like, you know, the first step. And then level three or level two is like, how do we have everybody working and like on, you know, great and quality education, not just education, quality education. And to TJ's remark, one of the big problems that we're trying to address at Whole Button is how can we replace the teachers because there's not enough teachers right now around the world. So it's not just that like they don't have the right level, there's not enough teachers at all. So if you want to grow the education system in your country, there's no way you can get it, you can do that at scale rapidly with training teachers was going to take like many, many years. And like, you're gonna have to tell people, hey, like come like to become a teacher, like which like people don't want to. Um, so yeah. like one of the things we have done is like- With is all the reasons like, TJ like, mentioned. <laughs> no, it's exactly, I, I totally agree with everything he said, like it's like right yeah. like to the point. So like you have to like think about, you know, all those things, yeah. So Great. basically uh, this, is how we, this is how we do it. But many times we work with partners, which are either Crisis or governments and so they have like a big yeah. plan and it's this big plan usually looks like the three levels that I just uh, talked to you about. Great thank you thank you so much. Um, I love what you talked about with the infrastructure has to be in place otherwise if you don't have that sort of le basic level of infrastructure you're almost kind of hitting your head against a brick wall. Saulo I want to pick on something that you said and it's also a part of EdTech when you talk about um, through TV, educating people that way. Because um, a lot of times when people think about education and, and technology, they, all, they only ever think of a laptop or a smart device. Um, can you just talk us through a little bit about what are some of those other mass opportunities that there are working with government to make sure that even the last man who, who doesn't have a laptop, who doesn't have a device, there can still be ed tech, can still benefit, can still be beneficial, and they can actually get um, good quality education. Yes, uh, like right now, um, uh, I see a lot of people, governments, talk about like the high level penetration of smartphones in Africa is higher than anywhere in the world, right? But at the same time, when we see to do those things to that, we can see that mainly when like our kids, when they use smartphones, just a laptop, the way the apps are built today is just for you to click on it and consume content, right? And mainly we just users of technology in Africa, right? So what we're trying to, to achieve is how we can turn them, our kids, in makers of technology instead of just users of technology. But for that, they need to have access to real computers, number one, not only just smartphones, like uh, tablets, smartphones should be, should be the second device at home. So kids need to have access to real computers. And also to computers, open source computer. That's why Rift One, the device we work on, on right now, it's open source. So you can open the shell, you can use the same boards to create other projects, so robots, like 
a kid with $60 parts, they can build a drone with Rift One, $60 parts, just to buy the motors, the propeller, and other stuff. So like right now in Cape Verde, they, we face a challenge because of COVID. So the kids need to watch a TV, digital TV, to access those contents. At the same time, they need to do video conference with their teacher. So we, ju we just launched a, a new platform called Reunion. It's a platform, a video conference platform like Zoom we're using right now, but it's totally free. Okay, you don't pay to enter it. You can use it for free right now. And teachers and students, they're using it in Cape Verde. You don't have to pay like Zoom. There is no limitation. You can talk one, two, three hours. Another thing we're doing is right now we're trying to install the server in Cape Verde. So there is no data usage because one of the challenge with Zoom, for instance, when you use Zoom for 30 minutes, you will be consuming 600 mega of internet. So kids, families cannot afford that. So they will start using Reunion, okay, the is reunion.cv for free, no uh, uh, fee to access it. And also you don't pay, you don't use your data. We work on right now with two major uh, IT telecom companies here to, so that can be able. At the same time, Rift One comes with 4G SIM card pre-installed. So right now there is a lot of uh, platforms that kids can access for free also with no data usage. That's why we say that uh, Rift One, you can use internet for free. So one of the challenges is how our kids can become you makers of technology instead of just users of technology. So one of the tools is for them is to have access to device open source device. Otherwise, uh, that's what we see in Africa normally, 95, 98% of the, the tech we make is all about software, not hardware, right? Hardware. So that's yeah. another challenge. And on the last two years, we have been teaching kids at school how to code using our device and selling this device is a cheap device for $35, $45. You just pay once and you have computer, digital TV, OTT. And it also we build our OTT over Android ecosystem. So you can install any app you want. Like people can buy Rift One just for Netflix. You know, it can, so it's an open source. You know, the ecosystem is open. Anyone can have a channel. And I can, can access it. App and mm -hmm. Awesome, great, thank you very much. Saulo, would you mind just typing in um, sure, sure. that um, zero rated data that you talked, zero rated website that you talked about? Um, and I love that, you know, I when I first heard about the option of zero um, rated or zero data rated websites, I was super excited. Um, open source, just give everyone the opportunity to just learn. Um, we're almost running out of time. I always think these conversations aren't long enough. So I want to give anybody an opportunity. If you do have a question that you'd like to ask any of our, panel, of, of our panelists, please do put the question in the chat box or you can come off mute um, if you're brave enough. I'm happy for you to, to have a chat. Just um, signify by either raising up your hand or coming off mute and then we can, we can, we can take your question. Um, as we wait to see if there's any other any, any questions, I just have you know one last question that I will go around. What policy con considerations are necessary for advancing the use of ed tech across the continent? Let's start with you, Julian. What policy considerations are necessary? Um, there's like I think there's different levels again here. I think you know again going back to my first point, like I think you know like in terms of policy, making sure that anybody has access to the internet so that you know. And directly we have access to education online is is the first one and then depending on the countries um you know you know regulations around um education or you know hard of or soft and it's very very hard to disrupt them um depending on the country again like so so if you look at europe and and uh, and in the united states it's very hard to move the needle uh and why is that because you know like uh as you know, like many times uh, in history, the, the winners of the markets have created the rules so that nobody else can disrupt them. And yeah. it's really hard to move the needle to really help because like there's like this massive, uh, you know, like amount of money like that you have to, to like to fight against. Um, when, when we look at, at Africa and Latin America, you know, like one of the big uh, advantage that 
um, you know, I can see when I have like those conversations with the regulators is that it's much more flexible because most of the time they have understood that they need to change and the change is coming no matter what. And they mm -hmm. need to like ride this wave. So I think there's a huge opportunity for both Latin America and Africa here uh, in terms of you know, policies uh, to make sure that they advance you know, the best solutions, the best disruptive solutions, and to work with private companies to make this happen. Yeah, thank you, Julian. This, that private-public partnership is extremely important. Tunji, last words from you, TJ. <laughs> yeah, so I, I would just say, and I'm going to just throw one thing in. I, I think that from the point of if view- You can do of, it in 30 seconds, that'll be great. <laughs> okay, 30 seconds. Access, access to, so access, um, internet access, device access, so that the learners, so that people can innovate, right? I'm saying this because we have seen a lot of movement in learning outcomes and in um, learner participation there, the gamification we do. We turn our whole learning into a battle in the land of Kirion. You have to free the land of Kirion after 50 years of war and strife. You become a citizen, you become a knight, you mm -hmm. become a grandmaster. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying you should learn physics, chemistry, and math, we don't talk about that. We just talk about this mythical world. And then you have engagement from sectors of children that are supposedly uninterested in learning. Once you can come to them and speak their own language, they learn. But what they lack is access. So regulatory support and um, governments taking seriously, smartphones are not for fun, they are for livelihoods. This thing is a $35 device. It is so out of the question to say that we want to give all our learners a smartphone, right? So, you know, it's, it's so anyway, I would say that we should start thinking about the number of learners, so there are 20, there are approximately 20 million um, African children in high school, in you know, senior high school times that number. These are figures that can be done. Let's think, can we give everybody a smartphone? The internet access, many of them, 80% of them already live within range of a mobile signal. We yeah. can do this. So that's do my it. own page. Awesome. Access. So Thank you. Access is that. Saulo, last words for you. And as we speak, could I just ask that, Julian, if you could just put in Hobartain's um, website on there, Gidimo, TJ, if you do the same, I think everyone needs to go and, and read up more. Saulo, last words from you before we wrap up. Yeah, it's, it's also is access to internet, you know, and access to the right tools. So we can build this new, you know, army of kids that we become not only users of technology, but makers of technology, especially find solution to build in Africa, you know, for, for us. Thank you so much. You know, I love what you say about not users. Um, and I love that they're di native, they're digital natives. They're born into technology. And um, it's almost like we're holding them back <laughs> if we're not giving them that access. I think ed tech is definitely the way forward for education. If anyone's out there who's still thinking about going back to in-person schooling the way that we know it, I think they need to move with the times because they're going to die a slow death <laughs> if they're not very careful. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot um, that we can do with education and technology. We, it, has, it has to go hand in hand. And more. And one thing that I would, the last thing I'd probably say is it breaks down borders and it breaks barriers. With ed tech, you find yourself in one country and you're learning something that you, you otherwise had to get on a plane to go and learn. Now you can do it in the comfort of your own home. So thank you very much to my amazing panelists, Julian, Saulo, and TJ. It has been an interesting, amazing conversation. Let's continue the conversation online on Twitter, um, um, et cetera. Remember to use all of the hashtags. Thank you all.